Hey y'all, it's Billy Hell, and we're back in the guitar room, and I wanted to talk about the ES-125, the Gibson ES-125. I'm no expert, I'm just a guy that owns a couple of them, and learned some things along the way. So, just some history right up front. They started production in 1941, they stopped in 1970, and this was always considered an entry-level student guitar. It's laminate. I'm uh, seeing that it's uh, maple popular and maple it had a mahogany neck with a rosewood fretboard yes i'm reading that right off my computer um i like laminates because they're less they don't care about the weather as much you know so i never uh i never don't buy something because it's a laminate um what happened here is i sold an amp a tone king falcon and i had some money and about the same moment that i got that money in my pocket literally in the parking lot an ES-125 came up in Nashville on Facebook Marketplace. And I was like, that's it. I'm just going to buy it. And I contacted the guy. It was the complete runaround where in the end you you want the guitar so bad and then the guy never calls you back. It was terrible. Which led to a, to a run of me looking up ES-125s on Reverb. And it turned out that a, a luthier I was working with, the store just went out of business, but uh, he was a luthier to a guy named Luther who plays with the Black Crows and the Mississippi All-Stars. And he plays the S125s on stage. So I walked in lamenting the loss of the guitar on Facebook Marketplace. And he said, well, hold on, Billy. And he literally walked in the back, came back out, and handed me Luther's main ES125, which I played, you know. And I was like, ah, okay, whatever. But then I plugged it in. And then I understood what was going on. This is also, I said in a previous video where um, I was judging acoustics on their sonic capabilities and I wasn't really thinking about how all of this air and hollow body affects the uh, electric tone. And it really, really, really does. So this was my first one. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a few things about what to look out for. Let's, let's see what I can remember because this was about nine months ago. Um, I ordered a 1946. It was beat up and had a, some hand-painted bird right here. And uh, and I wanted it beat up. I, I said I wanted something really beat up, not paying premium dollar. and um, I want, but, but a player. And so um, I got it. And when I got it, this is an arch top, right? And I said to the, I'm not going to name any names on that one, but I'm like, everything's good, right? And they're like, ready to go. It's great. And when I got it, the whole top was flat, so the arch was gone. So there's braces that run in here. And the arch top, of course, is always pushing on those. And the braces on that one had collapsed. And um, it took me a while to really get what was going on. But let me say this. That was a great playing guitar. And holy cow, it smoked when it was, when you put a little dirt on it. It had it. It had it, and I really, really debated about sending it back, but I spent enough money. I said, look, knock some money off, and then I'll feel good about this purchase. I'm going to scoot over a little bit. And uh, they wouldn't do it, and I sent it back. And I got to tell you, that was, like I say, about nine months ago, and I still feel like I should have kept that guitar. It was just so full of mojo, but the top scared me. And I guess without uh, that luthier I was talking to, he's gone. And so I don't, I don't have a guy that can do that now. Um, and then I went back on the hunt and I knew, I knew after buying the first ES what to look for. So what I was, what I would say is you want to see this picture. You want to see, uh, the distance of the bridge, how high the, the, uh, the bridge is, because that's a real teller. If the bridge is all the way on the legs, uh, all the way down, crank down, that's bad. If the bridge is all the way, like on the one I got, the bridge was so high, it looked like it would fall over or get ripped over to one side or the other. That's bad. You want that bridge about in the middle because then you've got some room to go down if you want to lower the action. And um, it just isn't a great indicator that your top isn't collapsed. So maybe that's probably the number one thing. You might ask for some, some internal shots. I wound up buying a mirror and getting in here and I saw multiple cracks where the uh, braces had snapped and I took pictures with my iPhone and I was like look you didn't tell me about this and they agreed at that point and said okay we'll give your money back ship it back to us I'm pretty sure that they ate the shipping too and I was prepared to pay for that um, what else um, 
with where the F notes are, if you see a crack here, or even even more troubling, is uh, where the pit guard is. If you see a crack coming out from the pit guard, that was the other thing. I couldn't see why it was collapsed because the pit guard really covered up the cracked wood. And uh, if you see cracks coming off the uh, the F notes, great indicator the top is is collapsed or collapsing or not good. So just a few things to know about. Now the other thing that I learned real quick was original hardware makes the guitar worth a lot more money. So you want to make sure that you're getting that original P90 that came with the guitar. This one has, a, and this is, wait till you hear the story about this guy. Um, I, I have the original everything on this. And the tuners, these are not original tuners. I, I bought these Clusons and aged them. The original ones had the, the ivory looking buttons, but man, they were like cigarette yellow and cracked and broken and uh, it stayed in tune but you felt like when you were tuning it that you would literally break them and I'm pretty sure you would so I pulled them off they're in a bag and they're in the case for this guitar and I I had the original case on the first one I don't think this one has the original case it did not it came in a hard case um, what else that's really the main things I would look for just when you're buying one, just ask all the questions and make them reply so that if it is a problem, you can come back and say, uh, you said this was okay and it's not. So playing wise, this neck is so comfortable. It's not a C. It's a little bit, it's, well, depending on the year, they got thinner, I think, as they went on up in years, like in the sixties, the neck got thinner and, um, so, but the neck is really comfortable. The frets are great for fretting. It's a really good playing guitar, but the magic really is in the P90. So if you're going for an acoustic tone, you tell me. We're going into a Princeton reverb and uh, got a little reverb on. Kind of what this is built for so that is the uh, these are the original pots and so that is all the way up we'll go all the way down there's not much range in there in that tone pot and everything in here was super crusty so I, I uh, used some solvent and the uh, Volume and tone cleaned right up and got real smooth. And these are just like, uh, I think like $60 Clusens that I put some, uh, it's etching solvent from Radio Shack, just aged it really for me and not I don't think anyone else is going to notice these things have great if I really wanted some checking on mine or crazing and this has a little bit you can't see it um, now after owning it I really realize what a gem this is so the story on this guitar is that it was purchased hold on let me memory here 1940 how would I know when it was purchased? I have the damn receipt that it that it was uh, bought with. So where's the year? May 9th, 1957. And uh, the cash down was $20. And the total cost was $147.50. Now I'm pretty sure 125 comes from the price. So when Gibson originally sold these, they were 125 bucks. That I'm pretty sure that's correct. There is the internet I could look at, but I'm not, it's not in front of me right now. So I have the signature of the parents who co signed with the owner, and I won't give his name out, but uh, everything's on here. So this came in. I did not expect this when I got the guitar, and I was really blown away. And I was able to track down a music store in the hometown of this guy, and I called and I said, Do you know of? And it turned out he had a nickname. 
So it took a minute, but the guy knew him, and he's from the same hometown that Graham Parsons was from. So this is a pretty pristine, I will never monkey around with this thing. Um, taking off the tuners, no big deal. You can always, I didn't drill in new holes or anything. You can put the old ones on if you want. I also changed out the bridge uh, just for me. It's got a Compton uh, brass bridge on it, but I can put everything back. And it, I don't know if this is one of the most expensive guitars in the room, but it's probably one of the nicest old guitars that I've ever come across. And if I ever had to sell something and thought I might make a little money, I think this might be the guy. All right, so I'm gonna play uh, just some chords and move around the fingerboard a little bit, and then I'm gonna get dirty so you can hear that sound because that's what I was looking for when I was trying to buy one and couldn't find it. never going to be uh, chimey. Let's go over here, plug into the board. This sat in a in a uh, guitar case, and then one other person found it and bought it from the widow, and then I bought it right after he got it, and it has been refretted, which is awesome. Something to think about. Anyway, this is the original ES125, and um, I will unplug her, and turn the amp off, and then we're gonna look at. The Rock and Roll Brother. 